So I'm not going to use the mic, but if you need me to speak up, just raise your hand, let me know. First of all, I want to thank Ernie for inviting me to talk at Game of Thrones. And uh, I believe Kelly LeGrow was uh, sponsoring today's event. I'm not sure if she's here, but I want to also thank her and her organization for sponsoring this event today. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, um, as Ernie said, uh, you know, everybody calls me Dr. Perot or Dr. P. It's not very hard to pronounce. If you remember Ross Perot from back in the day, Perot. Hit. A lot of people wanted to hit Perot, Perot hit. It's that simple. Okay, so it's Dr. Perot hit. But I don't mind if you call me Dr. P. And just uh, a little bit of background. I started my career in healthcare years ago as a Medical Service Corps officer in the United States Air Force, four and a half years active duty. I've been in the managed care space for quite some time. I uh, stood up Region 1 for TRICARE, if you're familiar with TRICARE. Uh, the program for military beneficiaries back in the 90s. And so uh, managed care is something that I know uh, very well, and I'm going to try to impress upon you that today, in terms of our healthcare system, things have changed, but the core principles around managed care haven't changed. And so when you start looking around your community, people that are coming in, new groups that are coming in, you know, one of the reasons why Ernie said, I want you to come and talk is, we want people to understand who are the new groups that are coming in town? What are we trying to do healthcare in this town? And in many states, um, this has happened years ago. California has been 30 years ahead of everybody else. Florida has got a different model, and I'll get into it um, here in a few minutes. But, you know, when he first sent the email out, he talked about the Gordian knot, right? And I'll be honest. I'm not a, a specialist in Greek mythology, so I had to look this up, but basically it's a uh, very complex or a problem that's hard to solve. And so I hope today, uh, probably just scratch the surface, okay, or the tip of the iceberg. Healthcare is complex, but you can simplify it. And I think what we want to do today is identify what is the problem in our healthcare system. A lot of you um, here are in different areas of healthcare, either you're a providers, you're on the hospital side, you're in the post-acute care side, you all have a role in this. And, you know, hopefully I can try to at least give you a 50,000 foot overview of what's happening in healthcare, where you fall in healthcare, and how you all can be successful. You know, this is not trying to take business away from one area of healthcare and move it to another because there's enough business out there for everybody. The, the question is, how do you do it? Where's the balance? Okay, it's just like work-life balance. How do you find that balance? And who are you gonna work with to find that balance? And so this is not as complicated as we make it out to be. So managed care, I'm telling you, you're gonna hear managed care throughout this presentation. Well, managed care in this country has been around since 1929, okay? And uh, it, it's not a concept that's new. It's come to the forefront because of all the issues that have been brought up in the media in terms of healthcare costs, healthcare quality. But there was a Dr. Michael Shadid in Elk City, Oklahoma, who started one of the first managed care uh, organizations, and it was really to help the farmers. And if you remember the history of healthcare, insurance was provided by employers, right? It was a benefit uh, that they wanted to provide to their employees. Well, obviously, even back then, these employers were concerned about costs associated with the healthcare being provided to their employees. And in this rural area, they didn't have a hospital, they didn't have specialists. And so he started bringing these resources together and charged a subscription fee to the farmers for their health care. Okay? And then from the 30s to the 60s, there were a lot more organizations that popped up. Pre-played health care. Okay? These were self-employed groups that were buying health care for their employees. And you'll see Kaiser. So Kaiser's been around. You all are aware of Kaiser. But there were other um, big cooperatives around the nation that started between 1930 and 1960. Now, essentially, these were all HMOs. Okay. And the provider community, when you say HMOs, they don't like it. 
they have a negative taste in their mind, whether it's between experience back in the 80s or 90s or in certain parts of the country where hospitals and physicians were left holding the bag, okay? I mean, they've been burned on managed care and HMOs, so it's not um, a likable term for many people in healthcare. But that's, HMOs have been around and the term was coined in 1970. So in 1973, the Nixon administration, okay, they passed the 1973 Managed Care Act. So we've had managed care in this country, formally started in, by the government, and they allocated $375 million. And what they required, employers that had 25 or more employees had to offer a managed care HMO option to their employees. Okay, were they worried about cost back then? Absolutely. And so since then, growth of commercial and managed care plans started late 80s, 1990s. Who knows what happened in the 1990s to pro proliferate managed care? Who happened? Who was the president? Right, who, yeah, Clinton, okay? And if you remember, when he was running for office, what was his platform? Healthcare, uninsured. There's too many people that are uninsured, okay? And so during that time, and, and when we start talking about Medicare Advantage, and really the focus moving forward on the presentation, I'm gonna use Medicare and Medicare Advantage as an example of what's happening in healthcare, but it applies through all product lines, whether it's Medicaid, whether it's commercial, whether it's, we're talking about exchange. So, all right. And, and I will tell you, uh, I asked this question to Larry back there a while ago, I don't know, a couple years ago, Larry, when did Medicaid start, right? And it's a, it's a, a trick question, right? Because the legislation was enacted in 65. The program started in 1966. The reason why I bring this up is since then, we've been in what we call a volume-based model of healthcare. So what does that mean? What does, what does that mean? The more patients you see, the more money you make. What's wrong with that system? There's a lot wrong with that system. You're not focusing on quality. You're not focusing on outcomes. And when we start talking about expenditures in the United States in terms of healthcare compared to other countries, we have a problem, okay? So um, the, the other interesting fact, Harry Truman, he was the first Medicare beneficiary in the program, okay? And the reason why he was, he was the first is back in 1945, he was also the one who had thought about a uh, national health care insurance program. So. All right, so two fundamental problems in health care, okay, and no one can deny this. Poor outcomes, high cost. What do you think? Anybody have any idea? Do we have a bad health care system? Do we have bad doctors? Do we have bad hospitals? Yeah, no? We have some of the best hospitals in the country. We have some of the best technology in healthcare. We have some of the best providers in the United States. But we don't do well compared to other economically developed countries. Healthcare expenditures continue to rise. That's the only point of this slide. But look at this, okay? When we look at our healthcare system, compared to all the other economically developed countries. Where are we on the bottom? Who knows? Somebody knows, or someone has a thought as to why this is occurring. No? Huh? Based on quality, access, cost, outcomes. Well, remember, there's difference, but this is based on data and statistics based on outcomes, costs associated, spend, okay? And there's a lot of data in literature that shows that the United States is on the bottom when it comes to looking at other healthcare systems, okay? So, look at it. U.S. healthcare spending per capita around 12,000. Other countries is close to 6,000. Um, life expectancy is worsening. Poor access to primary care and we rank last. I mean, that's the reality. 
Continued rise in health care costs. In 2020, 9.7% increase in total health care costs. $4.1 trillion. Okay, $12,500 per person. We spent 19.7% of our GDP on health care. Is that a problem? Why? I used to have a professor at Penn State. He was a Hopkins grad. And he used to tell us, who cares how much you spend on health care? It's the health of the individuals. It's the health of the community. It's the health of uh, contributing to a, a solid working labor force. Why is that important? What about if we spent 50% of our GDP on health care? Huh? Why? Bingo. If we spend more and more on health care, there's less and less for other programs like education, defense. Okay? That's why we've got to keep an eye on it. That's why it's important. All right. So when we look at where we're spending the dollars, okay, 33% in hospital care. 20% on physician and other clinical services. I mean, that makes up the biggest bucket. Okay. We know that uh, inpatient settings tend to be costly, and not to say that patients don't belong in inpatient settings. They do. There are people that actually need to be there, and there are people that actually don't need to be there. Okay. But the problem is that for every dollar that we spend on health care, 30% of it is is unnecessary. Okay, thirty percent. So if you look at, you know, if we look at Medicare alone, which spends spends close to a billion dollars, okay, to be exact, about eight hundred thirty billion, and and, and uh, you know, getting close to one trillion, thirty percent of that. I would have to look that up. I don't have that, but I mean, it's it. But when you compare it to all the other services, it is costly, but it's a small uh, component. It's not majority of the component on laboratories. And, and well, the labs, labs help in assisting in diagnosing, right? Diagnosis. So I, I will talk about diagnosis, and, and as a physician, I'll tell you this. Most of the diagnosis, and those good physicians that practice good medicine, 80% comes from your physical evaluation and history that you take on the patient. Lab conditions, imaging, are really to confirm the diagnosis, okay? But as physicians, but you could disagree, I'm telling you, as physicians and medical training, most of these conditions can be diagnosed if you do a good history and a good physical, okay? The story tells you a lot. The story tells you a lot, okay? It's kind of like fibromyalgia. How do you diagnose fibromyalgia? Are there lab tests for fibromyalgia? You'd get a test, right? But you can have symptoms, yeah. I mean, there are, there are lab tests, but what I'm telling you, if you have the condition, you're going to confirm certain diagnoses with those lab tests. But not all lab tests are going to be used. You're not going to say do a shotgun approach, and that's another problem that happens in the ER. When someone comes in, we have a shotgun approach. Rather than taking the time to evaluate the patient appropriately and identifying what's going on, let's do all these 10 tests, and then let me see what falls out. Right? That adds to the expenses. So listen, medical school, training, they'll tell you. You talk to any of the academic centers, they will tell you, if you do a good physical and you do a good um, history, you can get to the diagnosis. And I'll agree with you. There are certain things that you're going to need a lab test to find out if it's COVID or if it's the flu, right? You'll have a suspect. You, flu symptoms are pretty much generally across the board kind of same. COVID's a little bit different. But flu, if you got the flu, they suspect the flu, they're going to test it, right, just to make sure that, yep, you do have flu, and if it's not flu, could be another viral illness that's mimicking flu. Okay. But at the end of the day, we are wasting a lot of dollars in healthcare. Now, there's two issues here, okay? Why? We have 
the best systems, we have really good doctors. What's the problem? Why are we not making an impact? How many of you see doctors? How many of you have your own doctors? Raise your hand high, come on, everybody should have a doctor. How much time does your doctor spend with you? Huh? 10 minutes? 15 minutes? 15 minutes? Some people say five minutes. Some I've heard other people when I've given a different talk say, hey, they spent 45 minutes. Well, that's great. Keep that doctor. Okay? But it's not. The average is about 15 minutes. Now I want you to think about this. If you're a senior and you have, are on seven different medications and you have five or six different conditions, on average, 15 minutes, four to five times a year, is that enough face time? with your provider. You've got diabetes, you've got heart failure, you've got chronic kidney disease, you've got uh, COPD. Can a physician in 15 minutes really do justice in terms of taking care of you and providing you the best quality of care? It's not possible. Which means about an average an hour a year with your doctor or your, your provider. The problem is that we are still stuck in a volume based model of healthcare. If you walk into physician practices, how many of you walk into your doctor's office and you see that the waiting room is packed? You see, see that more so on specialists as well. Okay? There's things that happen in the office, sometimes they overbook right, because of cancellation rates. But if the waiting room's full, the doctor comes in, they're going to, what are you here for? Here you go. I'll see you back in three months. Well, that doesn't suffice. The problem is we don't spend the time to educate our patients. We don't have time to educate our patients. So for providers, I've been in that shoe. I've done primary care. I've had loaded waiting rooms. I don't have time sit there and talk about health literacy and their benefits with the, plan, with the plan. And so my home state of Maryland, back in 2010, this article came out in terms of consumer engagement, patient engagement. We are not engaging our patients. We're not educating our patients. So we've got to somehow figure out how to educate them, how to use healthcare resources appropriately, okay? what questions to ask. A lot of them are lost. They don't know how to access their health care benefits. Sometimes they don't even know they have the benefit. Okay? But someone's got to educate them. We have a broker community that does that. Right? They try the best that they can to talk to patients and try to educate them on what are your benefits when they're signing up for a, for a Medicare Advantage plan. Okay? The other problem beyond engagement for consumers or patients and educating patients is educating our and aligning incentives for our providers. That's where we fail. Okay? And that's why on the first slide, we were talking about a volume to value transition. We're moving into value-based care, and we'll talk about what that means. Okay? And value care. Ooh. But we can no longer survive under a volume-based system. And that's why you're seeing a lot of changes in the market and across the nation, because everybody is trying to figure out how they can get a piece of the pie, how can they get into value-based deals, okay, and how can they uh, do better. And, you know, a little bit of skepticism comes out because of all these groups that are coming in and are trying to do this. At the end of the day, they got to make money, right? They've got to bring in revenue to keep their lights open, doors open. So, but what it is doing is it is moving the needle in healthcare. So whatever their initial intent was to help in the healthcare space, it is helping, okay? All right, I wanna talk a little bit about primary care because if, if you truly wanna understand why these groups, these primary care-based groups are coming into Nevada, if you look at the data around primary care groups and their ability, primary care physicians and providers, and their ability to control costs, the data is there, okay? This is why the government, 
And when we start talking about Medicare Advantage, when we start talking about ACOs and the different types of ACOs, why are they tasking primary care providers to take the lead on this? And it's because there's historical evidence, literature, and studies that show people that are managed by primary care tend to have lower costs, about 33% lower cost of healthcare associated with it. Okay. Years ago, a company out of Boston, Wexford Health, don't know if they're around anymore, they decided that they were going to eliminate primary care physicians out of their network. Why? Like, well, you know, all they do is refer patients. All they do is refer patients to specialists. So why don't we eliminate them and just let the specialists take care of the issues? Well, you know what they found? Their costs tripled. Why? Why don't you send them to us? How many specialists do we have in the room? Any? All right, so I'm not going to offend anyone. Uh, but once you send them to a specialist, they're going to, you know, work them up. Like, you really want an ENT taking care of a cough and a cold? Right? So um, they found that their costs tripled. So when we start looking back at history and primary care, and even today, primary care is undervalued. And so, just looking at this data, there's a lot of data, like patient-centered medical homes, primary care groups that qualify for it. They're offering better communication and access to their patients, better care. And so when we start talking about groups like Kano and Centerwell that are coming into this market, this is what they're doing. Enhanced, advanced primary care, okay? So compre comprehensive care by PCPs does make a difference. And look at this. When we, this was back in 2012, and it might have increased, but primary care still is underrepresented and undervalued. Okay. 2012, 2002 to 2012, you can see there's a disparity between specialists and primary care. Why? Medical students did not want to go into primary care. Why? Bingo. Doesn't pay well. Specialists get paid more. Okay, so I mean that's leading to a problem, and you know there's some estimates that by 2035 we're going to have a shortage of 44,000 primary care providers. Okay, do we have any other pri primary care docs here today? Anyone doing primary care? No. If not, pass this along to them because we're going to talk about uh, <laughs> except me. All right, so. Look, we've defined the problem. I think, you know, poor outcomes, high cost. How do we uh, attack the situation? How do we begin to solve the problem? Okay. And I think you go back to 2012. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement, back in 2012, came up with what they called the triple aim, which CMS adopted. Okay. And the triple aim was let's reduce per capita cost. Let's improve the health of a population. Let's improve patient experience. Why patient experience? Hmm? Someone said it. Compliance. If patients have a good experience, it's, just, it's human nature. If you go anywhere and you have a bad experience, you're not likely to go back there again. Huh? Yeah, right? You're not going to go there. It, it's, it's, you know, when I talk to physician groups, and I say, look, if your front office staff is being rude to your patients, they're not going to want to come back, okay? Even though they may love their doctor, if the front office person is just extremely rude, no good bedside manner, they're not going to come back. And so the government has realized this. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement realized it, and they focus a lot more on patient experience, okay? And Carla knows this. CAP surveys, hospital CAP surveys, experience is extremely important for hospitals too. But that is being transitioned to providers. Now, they're asking patients, there's a health outcome survey, a CAP survey that goes out by CMS to the patients asking them about their experience. Now granted, they're asking these seniors, sometimes they can't remember what they ate for breakfast, but they are asking them, okay? And so, there's a lot more uh, emphasis placed on patient experience. And then, 
you know, CMS a few years later adopted improving clinician experience or provider satisfaction. Why? Providers were burning out. Okay, there's a lot of government regulation. There's a lot of things. I know I have my health plan partners here. I promise not to say anything bad about them, so I won't. Even though one of them gave me birdie last night at dinner. Um, but the physician burnout is real. It's going to cause a shortage. There is going there is a shortage in parts of the country in terms of primary care. And so they adopted this, like, how can we bring more satisfaction to providers in, you know, where they're working? So they're not leaving medicine. And it's real. Okay? So they finally got it, like, we've got to help our physicians too. We have to help our providers as well. So that was the, the quadruple aim that now stands. And what I want you to take away from this slide is, Everything that you'll see out there in your community, groups that are coming out, somewhere they're falling in one of these buckets. Okay, they're working on one area or another. And that's what these groups are doing, and we'll get more into it in a little bit. All right. So what are we now focused on? We're focused on decreasing utilization, eliminating unnecessary care. Okay? And, and there have been other... Uh, avenues, bundle payments. A lot of our hospital partners have gotten the deals and done, done bundle payments. Um, you know, there's managed care organizations, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, and accountable care organizations. We've got two kings of accountable care right in the room here today because we've got one of the best performing ACOs uh, in the country here in Nevada. All right, so let's talk about MA. All right, does anybody know when Medicare Advantage plans started? Does anybody know uh, all the different parts of Medicare? So part A, we'll just make it simple, hospital. Part B, outpatient. Part D, drugs. Why did the government miss part C? It's the government, so I wouldn't you know, be surprised if they didn't know the alphabet. Well, the part C program was the Medi Medicare Advantage program. That came about in 1997, it was effective in 1999, okay? And it was an opportunity for Medicare to contract with private insurers to take on the Medicare book of business and push some of that risk down to them, and we can talk a little more about how that kind of works. But since then, it's been uh, around, okay? And it's grown. And when we look at the Medicare book of business, the penetration in Medicare is around 37% across the nation, okay? 37%. It's going to get to 50%, and maybe even higher. Huh? Okay, so here in the state, you've got areas that are, that are already at 50%, but across the nation, it's about 37%. And relative, I know it's, you know, many years ago that they you know, brought the program about and, and launched effective in 1999, but... It's relatively new, and it's still growing, right? And so when we start looking at uh, what happens in the MA side, and our health plan partners are very well aware, you know, everybody in this marketplace, we've got a lot of health plans. We have a lot of new health plans that want to come into Nevada, and it's for the Medicare book of business. They want to sign up MA, okay? They want to bring on MA lives because it can be lucrative, okay? Average premium on Medicare, it's about a thousand bucks for an average Medicare patient. Okay. Average premium for Medicaid, Bruce, what is it, around 400 in this town? Yeah, okay. The, the, the Medicaid premium. See? Okay. So there's a stark difference when you look at the premium associated with Medicaid and Medicare. That's why everybody's coming in and looking at Medicare, okay? And there are opportunities to impact healthcare, but also it can be financially lucrative for these groups. So Medicare Advantage contracts with CMS, and then uh, on the fee-for-service side, we still have a huge portion of the Medicare business on the fee-for-service side. And here's the thing to take away. We know 
There's literature out there that shows HMOs, managed care, works. Five years ago, out of California, now get this, this is California, there was a study that showed that managed care plans excelled at quality better than their fee-for-service counterparts, and they excelled better at controlling costs, okay? That was the first one of its kind. Now that's California, not to say that happens everywhere, but there is literature that the program does work, okay? And so, um, Medicare fee-for-service, and when we talk about ACOs, why do you think ACOs came about? Look, the government said, we know this stuff works. We're limiting our risk, we're passing down dollars to private insurers, now let them deal with it. Let them go figure out how to manage those dollars and provide better care. But what was happening with this bigger population of Medicare fee-for-service? They could go anywhere they want, right? There weren't really any limited networks. They had choice. Who was gonna manage that? That's where ACOs came from, okay? They're like, let's, and this comes from, you know, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. And there have been many different iterations for accountable care organizations. But even in accountable care organizations, yes, you can have hospital partners, specialty partners, but where do they put their stock? In the primary care, okay? It's where these patients are getting attributed, primary care. Getting back to what I was saying earlier, primary care has shown to be impactful in reducing costs, okay? So, uh, just another slide, understanding Medicare. So traditional Medicare, there is no intermediary between CMS and whoever the contracting provider is, okay? Whether it's uh, the uh, actual physician, hospital, ACOs, on the Medicare Advantage side, sorry, uh, didn't have a slide with uh, Centene on it, but I would've put it up there. I'm not to slight you guys, okay? But these are all private insurers that are taking risk from CMS. All right. Now, let's take a little deeper dive into Medicare Advantage. These plans, Medicare Advantage plans, take risk. They take risk, capitation from CMS, okay? So whatever dollars that they get, they've gotta deal with, it's their bucket, if they lose money, you getting bailed out, Mike? Nope, okay, you're not getting bailed out. You've got a, a lump of dollars, you go figure out how you do this. Okay, well, one of the things that the MA plans realized earlier on is that they need partners, okay, to manage costs, manage quality. And so if you look at, there's, and I like to break this down in two different models, okay. These intermediaries that work with health plans, they can take on risk, unload some of that risk off of the uh, health plans. There's two models. And we've got one in here, P3, we have healthcare partners, uh, HPN out of California. These are MSO IPA models where they're managing a network. They might take, and I'll we'll talk a little bit about full delegation, full risk, but they're taking varying, varying levels of risk. And in California, I will tell you, their model is, if I'm a group, I'm gonna take full risk, full delegation from a health plan. And the plans love it because they push down the risk, they get to keep a certain portion of uh, margin without any risk. I mean, the Affordable Care Act tells you that every dollar that you spend in healthcare, you have to spend 85 cents on medical care, okay? Which means plans have about 15% to, to pay their administrative costs and then maybe a couple of percentage margin points. But if you have no risk and you have volume, that's a great business model. I can't blame the health plans for doing that. But these groups are successful because they've got strategies and programs around population health talk a little bit about that. So P3, H, H, HPN, HCP, they all have a flavor of how they manage that population. But it is focused on quality, it is focused on cost, and there's some other areas they're focused on as well. And they'll contract with the MA plans. The Florida model, you see these folks, they're in your market, okay? Village MD, Cano, Centerwell, they're all looking for the Medicaid, Medicare space. They want the Medicare business. So what's happening in this market? They're either coming in and developing new clinics, okay, which is harder for them to grow the population because they're de novo, or, and Ernie knows this, they're going out and approaching doctors to say, let me purchase your clinic. Why? Because if you have a high number of Medicare lives, they want your clinic because that's, they're going to bring that on and they're gonna be successful, okay? So if you're 
a primary care practice with two providers and you, maybe you have 800, 900 Medicare Advantage lives and not performing very well, and I think you can ask our health plan partners, people that work with physicians in the network, how well they do in this market in terms of quality and risk adjustment, and we'll talk about risk adjustment. Not very well. Half of them don't, don't understand it. But what these groups come in is they have a formula. They've done this before. They've been successful at this. They'll absorb you, they'll train you, and provide enhanced primary care model, and they will take risk okay, from the payer. And whatever that risk arrangement is, we won't go into, but they take significant risk. And so they have to perform. Okay. So that's what's happening in the uh, primary care space, and, and don't be surprised. I, I even heard lately, I heard Oak Street's coming in. All these groups are going to try to manage this population. They're going to try to reduce utilization, unnecessary costs, fraud, waste in the system, um, and it will continue. The other thing, understand, full delegation, when we talk about delegation, is delegation of services that historically the health plan has done, right? Now, our Centene partners that are here, uh, Mike will tell you back there that their uh, primary model is not to delegate, okay? They want you to take risk, but they don't want to delegate. They'd rather hold on to some of these functions, okay? As I was saying, in California, they take full risk, full delegation. Florida, they take full risk on full delegation, okay? All right, so how do we get out of this mess? Everybody's heard of population health management. What does that mean? Manage care, manage care, manage care. Hasn't changed, okay? Strategies and the flavor may have changed, but it's still managing care. You're managing costs, you're managing care, you're managing quality, managing access, and we'll talk about managing revenue, okay? So I'm just gonna give you a couple of bullets after this in terms of population health. But these population health companies, which Arcos is, uh, so is P3, uh, you know, they are looking at the high spenders, right? 1%. Accounts for 22% of the spend, 20% of the high utilizers account for 82% of the spend. So it's not the entire population, but it is a uh, significant aspect of the population that are high utilizers. Okay? So when we look at population health, we are trying to find out who these people are. Okay? So that opens up another area of all these technology vendors that are coming into the marketplace. And they're trying to tell you, we've got algorithms, we've got predictive analytics, and we're gonna tell you who, who pa which patients you need to target and who you need to go after, okay, to help drive utilization down and improve quality. Well, that's all good. Has it worked? Yeah, I mean, some people have had success. And you know what the problem is? All these companies talk about predictive analytics. They're trying to predict which portion of your population, whether it's from claims data or they're ingesting, you know, experience SDOH module, social determinants of health, and adding some factors there and coming out and spitting out saying, here's your list of patients you need to go attack. Okay. Well, that's great. I, I can figure that out. I can look at a spreadsheet and say, hey, this, this guy cost me $300,000 last year. It's not rocket science. If anyone in this room can tell me who's actually doing causal analysis, if there's a company that's doing causal analytics, and when I say causal analytics, it's analytics around what interventions actually work. It's great to identify the problem. What are you gonna do for them? If you don't have solid interventions that have proven over and over and over that they actually work, you're wasting your dollars. I've had debates in this over the last 10 years. Does any of this stuff that we do actually work? Okay, does it work? And the results, Bruce said it, so-so, yeah, okay? McKesson put out a study. Uh, I wanna say, was it 2017, Dr. J? Yeah, that, uh, and we talk, when we start talking about strategies, these population health strategies, and we'll, we'll get into detail talking about some of this stuff. But 25% they're only able to engage 25% of their population, okay? There's data to support if patients are in these programs, 
you are actually driving utilization, dropping readmission. Okay. But the programs are great, but if no one's enrolled, you're not going to get the value. Now, if you can get your engagement rates up to 50, 55 percent, those are the groups that are going to be successful. Okay, that can do it. And when we start talking about programs uh, and strategies, which is the next slide, we'll talk about this. I'm going to talk about Medicare risk adjustment really quick because even though this does not uh, focus on cost and, and, and providing care and identifying the high utilizers, okay, from a cost perspective, risk adjustment is extremely important. And here's the reason why. Since 1997, when MA plans came in, they mandated a risk adjustment model in terms of how to pay health plans. Okay. I want you to think about this. And, and risk adjustment has evolved since then. If you have a patient who's had an amputation, okay, do you think they're going to cost more in future years? Probably if they've got an amputation, they get stump infections. They're there's prosthetics involved, there's liners, right? That costs more money. People that have ostomies, artificial openings, they can get wound infections. Maybe they have to go back to surgery. All these things cost more money. And when these plans get paid initially, a base premium, CMS doesn't account for it. So what does CMS tell health plan? Health plan is like, well, we're not getting paid enough money to take care of this population. Prove it. Prove it to me that you have a sicker population. That's what risk adjustment is. If your risk adjustment score is high, it just says you have a higher disease burden, and we need to pay you more money. And it's a little more complex than that. I'm simplifying it. However, how does that happen? Who's capturing those folks? Okay, And it's clear. It has to be captured on a face-to-face -face visit. These codes have to be captured. And there is a hierarchical condition category. There were 79 categories initially. Okay. Came out of Harvard. A bunch of, bunch of physicians came up with the, the terminology and, and the different categories. CMS adopted it, and now we have about 82 or 83 categories. Okay. And there's all, C, all these ICD-9 or now ICD-10 codes that point to HCCs. If you ever go on CMS's website and you can't sleep, Look at all the HCCs they've identified. They've got HCC1, HCC2, HCC3, HCC4. These are all risk adjustment conditions. And if you document, we never tell people to go out and fraudulently document. Okay? Because if you've been listening to the news over the last several years, there's been several health plans that have been, their hands have been slapped. They have been fined for upcoding. Okay? We found, we, I mean, I will tell you, I don't, you know, in this market, I, I don't know what some of these other health plans do, but in other markets I've been, there's an attestation form that the plan will send to the provider and say, I need you to attest that these are, our conditions are good, okay? But what happens with those attestation forms? It's great to attest that the patient has a condition and they have that code, but if you start looking on audits and you start looking for the documentation, and the documentation doesn't have the diagnosis listed, there's no status, there's no plan, it doesn't meet the criteria for the audit, what's going to happen? It doesn't count. So um, risk adjustments, and I'll show you a, a slide in a minute why it really matters. Okay? But that's a component that a lot of these population health companies focus on. Now, our plan partners will tell you, hey, we can't talk about risk adjustment. It's inducement. It's, not, it's against compliance. But the intermediaries, like ourselves and other groups, we talk about it all day long. We actually train providers on risk adjustment. We want them to understand. We want them to go, because they are the ones that have to do it. Okay, now, when they don't do it, groups like ours, we develop our own in-house home wellness program, staffed by nurse practitioners, they get trained, and we'll deploy them out to the home to do these annual wellness visits, okay, or what we call comprehensive health, health visits. One of the things to understand that these annual wellness visits that providers do, they don't require a physical. Okay, it's really sitting down with the patient saying, okay, let me go over all the medical conditions that you have. Let's put a plan in place to have that discussion. It could be a 45-minute visit. And it is uh, kosher to be able to sit down and capture those codes on those visits. Okay? We were just having this discussion at dinner. Somebody forgot to add something, and now they're not going to, you know, providers that want to do this and add a, a physical exam to it, they're not going to get paid. But 
um, this is important, and it's not what you all think might be a history and physical when you go for an annual visit. It really is to just cover the conditions, make sure they're accurate. The other aspect is if they have it, document it. If they don't have it, get it out, okay? Don't have that code in the system. Don't submit that code. So. All right, so let's talk about, on the cost side, care management programs, okay? This is really to help attack the costs associated with long-term care. Now, the groups that are directly contracted with the health plan, provider-based groups like Kano, Village, MD, they do some of this you know, in their own uh, organization. They'll start mobile programs, you know, they'll outreach to their patients, they've been successful because they have a model in place, they do this. Um, MSOs, IPAs, we have care management programs that we, we work, and it's boots on the ground, it's people in the home, so transitional care, People that are being discharged from the hospital for the SNP. We want to make sure that there are no gaps. Okay, if something fell through during discharge planning process, that the patient's not bouncing back to the hospital because they didn't pick up their antibiotics or they didn't get their oxygen or the wound care provider didn't show up. Okay. Intense care management, and here's where I will tell you there is a stark difference in terms of effectiveness between telephonic care management programs that historically a lot of payers provide and boots on the ground, where you have nurses, RNs that are trained to take care of complex patients. They go into the home every two weeks. You get a couple of things out of that. You get the ability to understand what's going on in the patient's life. We all talk about social determinants of health. This is a great way to find out if that refrigerator is full of food, okay? Do they have safety hazards in the home? The last thing you want is an inexperienced provider going into the home and then sending them to the ER. That defeats the purpose. So when you compare the results between just telephonic, yes, there's some value with telephonic programs, but you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck on ICM programs, intense care management programs. Okay. Palliative care. No one likes. Yes, sir. How? So, so it's it's really shifting the dollars and where you're spending them, right? So when we do deals with with health plans, they pay us to do all this stuff with the end goal in mind is that we're going to reduce the overall total cost of care, right? And if we do that, then there's going to be dollars to it, okay? It's a lot more effective and cost effective to put food in someone's refrigerator than have them run into the emergency room because they haven't eaten in three days. And it happens. We found someone in Arizona living out of their van in the parking lot of the hospital system and every time they got hungry, they went to the ER, okay? That's true, I mean, we, we see it all the time, it happens, okay? When I was in residency, I used to see people on Thanksgiving because they were lonely, they didn't want to be alone. We had one guy who knew how to fake chest pain. He'd come in, get admitted for OBS, get a nice meal, and a couple days later got discharged. So, you know, people, people will come in, and these are all those social determinants of healthcare. So, really the answer to your question is, if you can move some of these dollars around where it's more cost effective to spend those dollars, you're going to have some savings where this can pay for itself. Palliative care is another, another program that a lot offer. There's a lot of palliative care programs out there that are focused just on education. Okay. And education is key. We talked about education. You want to educate your patient. You want to talk about end of life. Okay? You'll be surprised how many physicians actually talk to their patients about end of life. Not trained. Okay. I mean, we I mean, people have thought about death. Death is inevitable. It's going to happen. If you've got a a incurable disease or a terminal illness, well, does it make sense to continue to throw medical care at something where you are not going to get any benefit out of it? Right. But our doctors are not having these discussions. And I'll give you an example. When I used to do UM, I had a case of a, a patient who had end stage lung cancer, came in, had already done one round of chemotherapy, and then I get another request. And they, they, they couldn't even finish that first round of chemotherapy. Well, why are you requesting it again? Because the patient asked. So well, you're the provider. Don't you think you should be having that conversation with the patient saying this is futile? Let's talk about, you know, we spend, 
a lot of our dollars in the last 60 days of life. And so, you know, these companies, they have palliative care programs, it's an educational program, and it is a program to also manage their symptoms. Okay. The uneducated consumer, when they have symptoms, they don't know what's going on. Remember I told you we don't educate our patients? And when we don't educate our patients and it's unknown, where do they go? Where do they know they're going to get seen? Where do they know they're going to be seen and being taken care of? ER and the hospitals. Right? That's where they're going to go. Well, if you look at what, what payers are doing, right? I mean, you've got a lot of homeless people. You've got people that add, don't have homes. Like you look at United, you know, they've got apartment complexes in some of their markets for this same reason. Because these people don't have a, when they leave the hospital, they have nowhere to go. Back in, I want to say in the 90s, I can't remember the row in L.A., and anyone from California can remind me, but from hospitals, they were dumping people after discharge because they had no disposition. All right, um, let's focus a little bit on quality. Let's talk about Medicare star ratings. I mean, that really focuses on, on uh, clinical quality and preventive measures. And that's an important program to help out health plans. And that really is, you know, it's important for the health plans because if the health plan's five stars, they can enroll patients all year round, right? But it also speaks to quality. If you're at least four stars, you're doing something good. You address preventative clinical measures. There are more measures for quality than just the clinical measures that we tell providers to go out and close. There are administrative measures, okay? And I told you, this quality aspect in terms of consumer experience is now elevated. There's a lot more weight on the consumer experience side or the patient experience side. And so these groups will come in and provide these programs. Telehealth is another way. I gave a talk, I want to say two years ago, right here in Vegas to a whole bunch of international healthcare executives on, on the future of telehealth and telemedicine. It's a great stopgap measure. But there's no way you can do everything under telehealth for your patient. You just have to. You can't do a prostate exam, can you? No, not by telehealth, right? So just as an example, there is a place for it, but it's, it's not going to completely take over like some of the other people. And there are a lot of investment dollars being thrown at telehealth and telemedicine. Mobile medical services, everybody's providing. Kano's now got a mobile health program. They're going into the home. Everybody's setting up these programs. Um, and, you know, when you look, we talk about all these vendors that are coming in. A few years ago, actually, at the Nevada Healthcare Forum, I had met Dispatch Health, brought them to Arizona. That's what they're doing. They're going into homes, right? They're going to provide services in the home. They, they don't call it hospital at home, but they're now, you know, programs, parts of the country. There's hospital systems promoting hospital at home programs, independent groups looking at hospital at home programs. I don't know, uh, you know, if they're going to pan out because uh, there's a lot of liability there as well, but we'll see. Yeah. All right, so remember I was talking about risk adjustment? I just want you to take a look at these three, okay, in, in terms of what CMS, CMS pays, 2000. I told you risk adjustment. If you look at the first scenario, if the average risk score for a patient is 1.4 is demographic, and in the first case, that's close to the demographic graph, right? It's based on sex. Uh, it's based on any disabilities um, and some other factors, age. And if you look at it, and if your risk score on this patient, yeah, MA is going to get paid about 4,000. Now, if you start coding, it's 9,000. And if you do a really good job at coding, it's 32,000. Okay? So, if we don't code for the plan, they're not going to get the revenue. And, you know, Carly, you can tell me well, how much a average admission in this valley costs. You know, is it 15? Yeah, but on average, maybe 15, 20,000. Who knows? Maybe more. Okay. So if this is a real sick patient, they're in the hospital all the time because they need the care there, we need to get those dollars to pay for it. And so you've got to do the risk adjustment. It's important. Okay. All right. Real quickly on ACOs. So I told you we've got people in the room, one of the best ACOs in the country. They're doing well. I told you earlier that the ACOs were really set up to try to manage fee-for-service Medicare members. Right? 
So um, we've had iterations of ACOs. We've had pioneer ACOs. You had next-gen ACOs, which were different levels of risk and shared savings. You have the Medicare Shared Savings Program, which is probably still the largest type of ACO out there, okay, with multiple tracks and multiple varying levels of risk that these groups could take. And if you took higher risk, you got higher reward, okay? And this is basically an effort to bring group of providers, administrators together on how we can impact change. But again, ACOs rely on physicians and providers to educate their patients. And I'll give you an example. Back in 2013, I took over a company. They had an ACO. They started getting MA contracts, so contracts with the providers on the network. With that contract, they slipped them an ACO agreement. Okay? What do most practices do? They don't read this. This guy here, let's turn it in, right? So about a year later, when I had come in, the predecessor had done this. A year later, we're, there's materials going out to these Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries about the program, and it was a nightmare. They started calling their doctors and said, what is this? What you signed me up for? I didn't sign up. I'm Medicare fee for I can go anywhere I want. So the doctors weren't educated. The patients weren't educated. And so this system really relies, we talk about MA, we got to educate our doctors, we got to educate our patients. But the same thing on the ACOs. You have to educate the physicians and make sure that they understand this model. And then they have to educate their patients that they may be getting information on this. Okay? And it's just another mechanism to control costs on the Medicare side. And now, uh, you know, you've probably all heard of the direct contracting entity that is, is no longer going to be at uh, viable at the end of this year. It's moving to the REACH ACO model, realizing equity, okay, access, and community health. So the Biden administration said, we don't like the DCE the way it is. We want to change it up. They also changed, one of the biggest changes was, rather than only 25% of the providers having a vote on the board, now you have to have 75% providers as the, on the governing board that have voting rights. I'll leave this in the slide deck if you want to look through what, uh, comparing what the uh, direct contracting entity, and I know you can't read it, but when you get the slides, you'll be able to walk through it and the difference between the reach ACO. Okay, now, value equation. We talk about value in healthcare. How do you get value? Value for who? Value for the payer, value for the patient, okay? Based on outcomes, experience, and cost. Okay, it's a simple equation. But everything that I talked about is what value-based care, value-based initiatives is looking at, okay? And so some of the early value-based initiatives that were out there, and basically you're paying for performance. You're paying someone a dollar, you're expecting a dollar's worth of performance, okay? Not 50 cents worth of performance. Value-based purchasing was initially started back in, in uh, 2012, and that was actually for hospital systems. And there were groups like, uh, Sound Physician Groups out of uh, the state of Washington did an excellent job for the hospitals that they were working with in this program. And it was really focused on, it, there was a 2% reduction in payment to hospitals, and the bonus payments and payments back to the hospital was funded by that 2% reduction. And so if you weren't on board, and you didn't hit the criteria for quality in these measures, you lost 2% of your revenue right there, okay? And then on the, on the, um, outpatient physician front, you know, the sustained, sustainable growth rate formula that Medicare had for many, many years was flawed. Every year, physicians were getting paid less and less because the, the system was flawed. Okay? So what happened? They moved that and they changed that payment system under MACRA and uh, created a merit-based incentive payment system. Basically, pay for now, we talked about ACOs. If you're a provider that doesn't want to join an ACO, you can, under MIPS, there are guidelines in terms of how, what you need to do so you don't get reduced. And that applies to physician groups that are larger, okay? Some of the smaller groups it won't apply to. But some of the larger physician groups, you can, outside of an ACO, still do value-based care and work through the MIPS program. But I will tell you, 
It's much easier to go sign up with an ACO and let them worry about it and let them tell you what you need to do. Okay? Because in MA, these groups that are already working with the MA plans will tell you what to do. So ACOs we talked about, Medicare Advantage we talked about. Now, something that Ernie brought up. Talking about why are these physicians leaving money on the table? Okay? Why are they leaving money on the table? So how are you going to succeed if you're a primary care group? If you're not going to be bought out and you're a primary care group, a uh, small one, and you work with groups like ours or other ones, we're there to support independent practices okay, if you don't want to be bought out. And that support means bringing analytics to the table for you, giving you reports, helping you, educating you on risk adjustment, helping you on how to achieve your incentives, because every plan offers incentives for performance. There's a lot of money that's being left on the table because our physicians don't get it, they're not working towards it, this is all legal. We want to pay you for performance. We want to pay you uh, to do a better job. We want to get your mindset out of the volume to value. See less patients, make more money. We provide high quality care, okay? So, you know, a lot of, a lot of primary care groups can do capitation if they want to. There are some pitfalls with capitation that they need to but that's another way of taking on risk, okay? The only feedback that I always get from, from uh, skeptics on capitation is, well, if they're capitated, I'm gonna get paid regardless whether I see the patient or not. Why would I see the patient? I get the money. That's where if you're a payer or you're working through a payer and you're giving them capitation, you better have systems in place to monitor quality outcomes, okay? So here's one, welcome to Medicare. You go talk to some of the provider groups and, and maybe Larry and Bruce could tell me in this market, how many people actually bill that code? How many of them actually build annual wellness visit codes? Look at the look at the revenue that they're leaving on the table. Okay, initial pays 173, subsequent's about 117. Then you've got transitional care management codes. When a patient gets discharged from the hospital and you get them in your clinic within seven days, you can bill 236 bucks. If you do it at 14 days, you can get another 170 some odd dollars. You can't bill both of them, it's one or the other, okay? But I think the problem with primary care, they don't know when that patient's discharged from the hospital. You talk to your primary care doctor, I didn't even know they were there, okay? And I know we have an HIE here. We're trying to be able to, to give this information. And for those providers that work with groups like ours, um, or has another way of getting this information, or directly from the health you can get these revenues. This is an easy start for you. You just need to put the process and the protocols in place to be able to do this, okay? Participate in the ACO. That's a lot of revenue. Larry, how much money have you paid out over the years to your providers? Tons, you don't have to give exact, yeah, tons. It's additional revenue to the providers. And all they had to do was sign up, listen to what Larry and Bruce tell them to do. You do it right, you're gonna get some money, okay? All right, on the specialty side, if we have specialists, you can do specialty capitations with a health plan. Again, there's pitfalls with it. But payers are always looking to save dollars. And if it makes sense, it reduces their risk, then they'll honor it. Depends on whatever specialty you're doing at. Years ago, I did a uh, specialty cap for uh, podiatry, and I you know, excluded all these people out of the network. I got calls from five podiatrists. Well, how can you do that? Why are you kicking me out of the network? Business reasons. How can I get back in? And I just told him, I said, go compete. Set up your own network. Give me a better price. Give me better quality. And we'll listen to you. So the specialists can also play. There are specialty MSO uh, companies out there that uh, will take on management of certain specialties. The New Century Health uh, in the oncology space is the one. And some of these will do CCM and RPM. And we'll talk a little bit about CCM and RPM. There's money to be made on CCM and RPM. And if you really think about the CCM program and the RPM program, it is really to get data. It is on the Medicare fee-for-service side to have care plans put into place so you're paying attention to their chronic conditions and that you're managing those chronic conditions. Okay. Now, we've done with specialists on risk adjustment, you know, they, all the incentives that I've administered in the past were really giving them to uh, primary care providers. But you can set the same thing up with specialty providers, okay? If your cardiologist or your nephrologist um, are coding certain codes, and you have an analytical system that identifies you coded it first, you can add 
a kicker to their revenue stream. So, all right. So CCM, let's talk about CCM. Primary care doctors, even specialists that are engaging in CCM. Now this is average, $94 a month or $120 a month on RPM. Okay, this is to help Medicare fee for service. Some people will say, well, if it's a Medicare eligible or payable code, then shouldn't the MA plans pay for it? Sure, pay for re remote patient monitoring. But CCM's a little bit different. They will somehow pay for CCM, but maybe the co-pays are too high, no one will enroll, okay? You'd have to talk to each of the plans. But because they have plan partners like P3 ourselves, that's not a huge program on the MA side, but on the fee-for-service side, that's revenue for providers, okay, doing CCM. And there are multiple companies out there that will approach you. Doc, you don't have to do anything. We'll do everything. We have the technology. We have the platform. All you need to do is sign off on the care plan. And half the time, some of them will look at it. Some of them won't. They'll sign off on it. They'll make money. Great, okay? But the intent was if we get providers to focus on the chronic condition and we can monitor those chronic conditions, we know we can drive the cost of care down. Yeah. All right. All right. Couple, couple final slides. All right. Analytics, I'll say one thing, is extremely important. If you want to work in value based, make your decisions based off of data. Know how to analyze the data. Make sure you invest in technology to give you the data that you need. Um, and more personalized treatment for your patients. Okay. That's all I'll say there. Now I want you to see how Arizona ranks in terms of healthcare. This is from an independent group called Commonwealth uh, Health Fund. You may have heard of them. Overall, overall ranking, 49th out of 51. And you, this is Nevada, okay? And you say 50, well we only have 50 states, but don't forget about the District of Columbia. They're in here too, in the rankings, okay? Overall ranking, access and affordability, 44th. Prevention and treatment, they're last, okay? So when, you know, people ask me, oh, like, yeah, we do great in healthcare. Our doctors are doing the best. Well, the data doesn't show that. So is there room for improvement? Well, look, I think you have a valid point that there are people that come from other parts of the country, right? They're coming, and people are moving here. There is population growth. I just don't know, and I don't know if we've got any data to show that. Yeah. So um, look, there's, this slide basically says there's a lot of opportunity. You ask why people are coming into this market, there's an opportunity to improve health. There's an opportunity to improve health care for Nevada. And by doing that, they also have an opportunity to make some, some, some dollars in this market. Okay. Let's talk a really, really quickly about Medicaid. Now, I said this before, all these principles that we've talked about, whether you're doing capitation, population health services, applies to Medicaid as well. In this market, you've got managed uh, uh, Medicaid here with, with four entities. And so one of the things that is coming up on Medicaid, and, and it's going to impact this market and across the nation, when the public health emergency went into effect in, uh, I think it was July of 2020, because of COVID, more people qualified for Medicaid. Now, there is discussions that the public health emergency uh, is going to end in July. I think mid-July, and if that ends, you know, there's a redetermination process, maybe 20% of the people that qualified for Medicaid may not have Medicaid any longer, okay? I think long-term, we, we want to see the, the, the reverse in terms of percentage of GDP. Right, back in 1980, we were at 8% of our GDP on healthcare. Maybe we weren't spending enough. We probably get to about 15%. I think I'm okay with 15% of the GDP in terms of national health expenditures. And we're not talking about that big of a... 
We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. If you want to talk about single pair, we'll talk about it. It's not going to happen, but we'll talk about it. Okay, but anyways, I mean, keep this in the back of your mind. I know the health plans are looking at a way, if they are a managed Medicaid entity, how do we get them onto our exchange pro, uh, product, if they have one, moving them and, and getting them qualified or subsidized under an exchange product. But it's going to come. Now, what I'm hearing, and I don't know if in the back there you guys have heard any different, but, I mean, they've already extended it once to July. There is talk that they're going to extend it till the end of the year, and really not because of the uh, cases and the surge in COVID with the new BA2 variant, but because of the politics, and it's an election year. Right? So this may get extended till the end of the year. More to come, but, but keep that in the back.